so I wanted to introduce the speaker today, who's uh, Patrick Walsh, and a little bit about Patrick. Uh, he took four hours, a four hour delay getting here yesterday in the wonderful weather we had, uh, but he made it. Uh, and he didn't have to get that, what's funny is he didn't have to get all that far from, uh, from uh, Baltimore, but it, it took a long, long time to get here. Um, so, but I'm glad he's here. And uh, Patrick uh, did his master's and his uh, PhD at the University of Central Florida in um, uh, environmental and resource economics and did a minor in behavioral uh, in experimental economics. Um, and he's done a lot of work in the hedonic world. Uh, and he's also uh, published some papers looking at water quality indices and various other environmental economic topics. Uh, right now, he's uh, been working since 2009 at the EPA and the National Center uh, for Environmental Economics. And uh, the work that he does there focuses on uh, looking at regulations and water quality regulations and contamination and how you uh, Correctly, how you review that from an environmental economic uh, perspective, these uh, new regulations. So, um, join me in welcoming him, and uh, hopefully, you all uh, find this topic to be very interesting. All right, can everybody hear me okay? It's uh, working. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Anthony. I'm really glad to be here. Um, you guys have a beautiful campus. Uh, I uh, was telling Anthony that I actually had relatives that lived in St. James growing up, so I actually spent a summer in St. James, so moderately familiar with the area, although it was quite a few years ago. Um, so I work in the National Center for Environmental Economics at the EPA, and we serve kind of a very interesting role. Um, it's kind of like having a teach uh, university position in that we're all required to actively publish as part of our job, but instead of the teaching component, um, we have to review and contribute to regulations. So we have a lot of different water uh, offices at EPA, Office of Water, Office of Air. And so you know they're passing a lot of different regulations. And before the regulation can go to OMB to, you know, uh, for them to assess, it has to go through an internal check at EPA. And that's kind of the, one of the main roles that NCEE served is we make sure that all the cost benefit analysis and all the environmental valuation that's done by the program offices is done correctly. So it's kind of neat in that we got to use you know, a lot of the stuff you pick up in grad school, you know, uh, for environmental and other classes, and make sure that the program officers are doing that correctly. So it's really nice that you can actually apply the theory directly to environmental regulation at the EPA. And so there's about 25 econ PhDs in NCEE, you know, assigned to various different offices. And so today I'm going to be talking about a project we did on the Chesapeake Bay watershed which contains uh, six states and the District of Columbia. There's a small portion of New York in the watershed for Chesapeake Bay, uh, certainly not part of Long Island. Um, but a you know, uh, very large watershed and one of the largest estuaries in the world, especially when you look at the number of people in the watershed. Um, but the bay has been beset by chronic pollution for years. Uh, over the last 25, 30 years, there's been extensive restoration efforts trying to clean up the bay, um, several local, state, and multi-state efforts, but um, really insufficient progress. Water quality criteria in the area are still exceeded regularly, uh, still lots of pollution in the bay, um, still a lot of beaches getting closed due to bacteria and other issues. And so finally in 2010, um, after uh, the Obama administration uh, issued an executive order, um, the states and the EPA got together to issue the TMDL, or Total Maximum Daily Load, which is basically a pollution diet on the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that can enter the bay. And so, you know, there's been, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of efforts before to try to clean up the bay, and so they really wanted to do something different this time. So there's actually extensive measures for accountability this time. All six states in DC are on board this time. And so that's really uh, a big part of the problem with the Chesapeake Bay watershed is that a lot of the pollution is coming in from uh, Pennsylvania, particularly they have a lot of non-point source pollution, nitrogen and phosphorus the farms. It's all washing down into the bay, but then um, a lot of the negative uh, aspects of it occur in Maryland, Virginia, and Delaware. And so the people who are putting a lot of the pollution into the bay um, you know, don't really see the effects of it. 
So in order to have a lasting solution, you really have to have everybody on board. And what we really have, uh, in addition to accountability for everybody involved, there's very good state-of-the-art modeling tools. So this pollution diet is broken up into the individual county level based on modeling done by Chesapeake Bay Program Office at EPA. And so, you know, instead of having these overall goals that are kind of at 2,000 feet that, you know, don't really influence people, this time we really brought it down to the individual county level. And so the individual counties are being held responsible for the pollution that they do. Uh, and so you know, the, the main thing I'm going to look at in this paper that should be one of the main benefits of the TMDL is an increase in water quality. Uh, which brings up, um, you know, when EPA is doing this uh, in conjunction with all these states, there's going to be significant costs associated with this. So what are the economic benefits of this? The um, costs are usually easier to estimate because, you know, a lot of times you're uh, putting a certain uh, thing on your wastewater treatment plant. Um, you know, so it's a lot of the engineering costs that you can see what equipment they have to buy um, you know, you can see other things. So it's easier to estimate the costs, but when it comes to um, the benefits, that's where you have to have environmental economics come in and you need valuation and other things. Because it's not always clear what the benefit of improving water quality is in terms of dollar values. And so um, a lot of people in my office got pulled into this work to try to assess the benefits of this, and then the Chesapeake Bay Program Office got assigned to looking at the costs. Uh, and so, before I talk a little bit more about this, um, it's important to talk about what we're not doing. Um, because we regularly had to have this battle with particularly EPA leadership and several others involved, uh, lobbying organizations, but whatnot. That what we're not doing here is calculating the value of the Chesapeake Bay. So we're just looking at um, a change in water quality. So the change from the baseline water quality to a new TMDL based amount of water quality, which should hopefully uh, be more, you know, given that this thing works. Uh, so we're not placing a value on the total value of the bay. And this is important because, you know, it's not to say that you shouldn't try to, say, look at all the ecosystem service flows or ecosystem service values coming out of the bay. Those are very important things. Um, but the tools of environmental economics look, normally look at marginal changes, smaller changes. And you know, the reason this is important is because uh, the theoretical models underlying a lot of things in environmental economics are based on smaller changes. So you'll see out there a lot of stated preference literature that's based on surveys that try to place the value on the resource. There's a lot on water quality, for instance. And so this is kind of the difference between asking on a survey, you know, what would you be willing to pay to improve clarity by you know, six inches across the bay? An average person, you know, they might have a reasonable response to that on about $20. You know, you, you, you might be able to assess that. Um, but on the other hand, if they ask you, you know, what is the value of the bay? Here's my uh, hand-drawn simulation here of what the bay looks like if you fill it in. Um, very sophisticated modeling. Um, but if you ask somebody, what is the total value of the bay? Most people don't rationally comprehend, like, how do I even place a value on that? For some people, it's infinite. I mean, it's something you can't quantify. So, you know, that's the important thing to recognize is that our baseline isn't bay versus no bay. Our baseline is comparing the bay as it currently is to a minor change in water quality. And, you know, by some estimates, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, the TMDL probably will result in about a 10% improvement in water quality across the bay, very roughly speaking. Um, so, in order to do this, um, a lot of economists and NCE involved, I think there's 12 of us who got pulled into this project. We're doing a state of preference survey, so asking people um, through sophisticated methods about um, what they're willing to pay for water quality and having them trade off among choices between how much it would cost and what it would do. Uh, and then we're also doing a variety of revealed preference methods that I'll be talking about here today. And the difference between state of preference and revealed preference is when you're looking at revealed preference methods, you're looking at things that are actually observed in the market. So for instance, you can look at recreational fishing and we have intercept surveys from NOAA and several other places that ask people where they go fishing. So you can look at how people respond to, say, algae blooms in the water. Do you see a lot of fishermen going to other places in the bay? There's a lot of algae blooms. And, and how much money are they spending on, instead of going one place, driving a lot further to another place? So we get these values from responses that we see people actually doing. 
So we're not just asking them about how much they value, we're you know, inferring it from decisions that they make and that they reveal to us. Um, you can also look at commercial fishing, for instance. Look at how much water quality has changed and see what the total value of commercial catch of a particular species does. Uh, but what we're going to focus on here is hedonic property analysis, which looks at property sales and how property sales are influenced by environmental um, attributes. Um, we also look at several other smaller categories, groundwater effects, um, cost of dredging, wastewater treatment plants, and several other smaller impacts. But uh, these are the main big ones that we spent a lot of time on on the top here. And so the basic idea of hedonic analysis is that if you pull in thousands of home sales, big sample of home sales, you should be able to tease out what's affecting those home sales statistically. So you assume, for instance, that price is a function of bedrooms and bathrooms, where the house is located. And then also a characteristic of a lot of homes is the local environmental attributes. And that's what we're really interested in is, you know, once you control for all these other <coughs> determinants of price, what impact do nearby environmental amenities have on the value of your house? So for instance, I have here on the background a slide that I pulled from Zillow where <coughs> Zillow's estimating the value of all these houses. So it's kind of what we're interested in doing is looking at all these home sales where a transaction is actually taking place and, and matching that house to all of its observed characteristics and try to tease out if and if so, how much influence the environment had on it. And so <coughs> we're, we're talking mostly about water quality here. And so there's a rich uh, past literature on local environmental characteristics on home prices. There's been a variety of studies that show that um, things like air quality or um, particularly Superfund sites can have a direct impact on home sales. And it, intuitively it makes sense. I mean, nobody wants to live near a Superfund site. So in order to sell a home near a Superfund site, you'd probably have to sell it for less than a comparable home. So we're taking that idea and applying it uh, to other issues. Um, there's been uh, water quality uh, literature is not as far off as uh, in terms of the amount of studies as air quality and land contamination, but there have been several past studies that show that all else equal, um, living near uh, water that's cleaner or higher quality uh, is worth more to homeowners than places with dirtier water quality. And this is particularly pronounced for waterfront homes. There's been a lot of literature on waterfront homes and now studies are starting to look at homes beyond the waterfront. So does it affect homes that are, aren't directly on the water? And so, you know, so the, the basic idea of this is, here's a rough map of the Chesapeake Bay and uh, water quality in the bay. So this is uh, clarity, where red is poor water clarity and green being good. So in Anne Arundel County, for instance, we're gonna look at homes all across, all across the county and compare houses that are sold in areas of worse water quality to homes that are in better uh, water quality areas. And across all of these thousands of homes and lots of variation in water quality, try to tease out the impact that it has. And so um, we ideally wanted to come in and get home sales for the entire uh, Chesapeake Bay area. Unfortunately, um, Virginia and Delaware really don't have good property sales. So Maryland is really nice because all counties are required to upload their home sales to the same place. And so you can buy all Maryland home sales for, uh, I think with a government discount for us, it was under $10,000. You buy all home sales back to 1996. Every single home, we have a record of when that home was sold, its characteristics, bedrooms, bathrooms, location, you know, square feet, variety of characteristics. A and we can also match that up to a GIS map with the location of those. So we can add additional characteristics. There's where, what census block they're in. So what are the local economic conditions? How far are they from uh, downtown or DC or Baltimore? Um, but when it came to getting Virginia data, there is not this central administration of this. So we had you know, several smaller counties that wanted over $10,000 for just one county of bad data. Um, <laughs> others just didn't have it. I, I, it's, it's funny, we, we try to, I, I'm in a few hedonic projects looking across the U.S. And, and there are some areas that are just opposed to giving you these data. I mean, I get, especially given that I'm EPA and I'm calling for the government, there are some areas 
uh, that are very opposed to the EPA and the government. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I've called a few places looking for home sales data and <laughs> told in no specific terms that I'm, they're not interested in giving anything to the government. Uh, yeah. no, and, and then there are places like Wyoming that actually have laws against <laughs> revealing this information. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of variation across the area. So, <laughs> long story short, we, we weren't able to get uh, good data from Virginia. Um, so what we, we're going to end up doing is estimating hedonic models in 14 Maryland counties in these red areas, and then taking those estimates and applying them to homes in the Virginia area along the waterfront. So places that are located on the Chesapeake Bay are one of its major tributaries. We're going to do a, what's called a benefits transfer and take the estimates we get from Maryland and apply those nearby to try to get an estimate of what the total benefits of improving water quality in this area are. And so um, from EPA's guidelines, we've got a, a document that goes over good practices for environmental evaluation. Basically talks about how uh, a benefits transfer is when you take environmental values from a study case to a policy case. So this happens at EPA a lot where we want to know what the value of improving water quality is. And so ideally, you'd look at areas where water quality is being improved, kind of like what we're doing here, estimate an original study and see what the values are. But I mean, this takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money, staff resources. So you're not always able to do that. So what they're often doing is looking at the literature, looking at what previous studies have done, and they're taking those values and applying it to what you're doing here. So it's kind of a, roughly what's called a benefits transfer. Um, so you're going from the study case to the policy case. But you know, you can get significant amounts of error in doing this. If the underlying studies you're using are from a different part of the country or don't look at the same environmental attribute, you have to be really careful in doing this benefits transfer. And so you know, even when you have something that's very qualitatively similar to the policy case, um, you may still have a very different environmental change. You may have a very different scope. Um, you know, for instance, one might be looking one hedonic study might be looking at algae blooms or, or nitrogen, and another is looking at clarity or your regulation improves uh, in organic nitrogen. So, you know, there are a lot of things um, that you really need to account for to do this. Um, you know, you might have some studies from the West Coast that you try to apply to the East Coast. Well, is that really relevant? Um, and so, you know, on top of that, um, you might be looking at an area with really high income. And it may be the case that places with higher income, there's, there's some literature on this that richer people care more about the environment. So, um, you know, it might be the case that if you estimate a study in a place with high economic characteristics, then it's not appropriate to bring it to a poorer area. So these are all very important considerations in benefits transfer. Um, and so what we're going to use is a, a meta-analysis of benefits transfer. And normally what you would do here is take several different papers um, all on the same topic. So take, for instance, several different water quality hedonic papers and run regressions on those. Uh, where were they located are things you want to control for? What are the economic conditions there? Some of the stuff I just discussed, you know, what type of environmental change are you doing? Run a regression on that to try to control for these things and then you use the regression to transfer value. So basically you're trying to control for all this stuff. Um, the advantage of what we're doing here is instead of looking at a bunch of different underlying papers with different underlying methods, we're going to use um, the 14 counties from Maryland as these sample points. So all of them are coming from the same data set. They're all using similar techniques. So there's a lot less to control for. And so we think this is going to make it a much more accurate benefits transfer. Because you know it's all coming from us. We're running the regressions on those 14 counties. And it, and it should be much more homogenous than other areas. Um, and so as I discussed earlier, we've got this full set of parcels uh, and full set of property sales from 1996 to 2008. Uh, lots of different home controls, uh, GIS maps we use, control, you know, try to control for everything we can. Um, we went around and talked to a lot of local people about this and they advised us to put in a lot of interesting things. In, in a few counties we even put in whether or not you're within 10 miles of the nuclear power plant. Uh, because from, from the people we talked to in St. Mary's County and a few areas around there, apparently you can hear they have warning sirens every month, kind of like a test drill that you can hear. and so. You know, if you're buying a home and you hear one of those things go off, you might think that it could affect your home value, so you might want to control for that. Um, we also do extensive time controls. 
because the recent uh, boom and bust of the housing market cycle is really important to control for. You don't want that to contaminate any of your results. So we use a lot of uh, temporal control to try to net that out of the data. Uh, and we also use spatial econometric models. And these try to control for things you can't observe. Um, and so uh, the biggest thing we want to control for is, uh, you know, for those of you who, who buy a house, who have bought a house in the past, usually um, you get a comparable sales report from your realtor or from your bank. And what that's basically doing is looking at home sales nearby. So you know, in your neighborhood, there have been three houses that have sold recently. And so they kind of look at what they sold for and look at their attributes and try to get an estimate of your home value based on that. And so that means that homes within a particular neighborhood are um, somewhat correlated with each other because you're using all the nearby home sales to kind of try, try to um, get an estimate of that for both the bank and your realtor. And so we try to use spatial econometrics to try to net out this neighborhood effect. Um, for our water quality indicator, we're using clarity, uh, which is a uh, light attenuation coefficient. And you know, this light attenuation coefficient has an uh, inverse relationship to Secchi disk measurement. So more of you might be familiar with the Secchi disk, where you take this black and white disk on a rope, lower it into the water, and then record the depth at which you can't see it anymore. And so um, a lot of past hedonic literature has shown that clarity is really good because it, it's salient for people. When you go by a house and if it's on the water, you can see clarity. Um, it's salient for people and it's usually connected to ecological um, outputs. So you know, it would be hard to use something like uh, nitrogen, for instance, because you know, when you go by a home, it might not be as visible in the water what nitrogen levels are. Um, you know, and there are several other underlying things, like temperature might be difficult. You might be able to see how healthy the you know, ecosystem is there by looking at the insects and whatnot, but you know, for most people buying a house, clarity is probably one of the more relevant things. Um, so, so that's what we use. It's also convenient to us that the Chesapeake Bay Program Office um, has uh, what's, what they call an interpolator. And then, so based on monitoring stations throughout the bay, they reduce an estimate of water clarity at each of these small cells, which are a maximum of one kilometer by one kilometer. And so we have a really spatially refined data set. I don't know if you can see this from the back, but there's are all like small squares, rectangles in here that represent, we have an observation of clarity at each one of those. And not only can they estimate that for uh, past data, but they can also forecast it going forward. So they have a lot of good simulation models that they've published that, you know, if we want an estimate of the TMDL for 2025, then they can produce a, a decent estimate of that. So that was really important for us since we want to see what the impact of the TMDL is. It plays a value on that. It's important that we have a forward-looking uh, water quality indicator. And so th this is really nice for us because all homes that are located near here, we can match those exactly up to a very spatially refined level. And so just to illustrate um, the variation in uh, water quality over time, because we also want variation across space to take advantage of, but also over time. Um, this kind of shows from 1991 to 2000 that you really do see a lot of variation in water quality that we can take advantage of in our models. Um, the way we also model this is that we look at um, what we look at homes differently. We expect naturally that waterfront homes probably care the most about water quality. I mean, your house is right on the water, you're staring at it every day, you go fishing off your back porch. Um, so we're going to model, we're going to create a different interaction term for homes that are on the waterfront versus homes that are 0 to 500 meters away and non-waterfront, you know, 500 to 1,000. So basically every 500 meters out to try to see if the value of water quality changes across these different buffer zones. I mean, naturally, just intuitively, you'd think it would kind of drop off as you go away. There's been one or two past papers that have found this diminishing gradient the further you go from the water. Um, you know, and going into this, I, I think the two papers that were out there had about 1,000 feet to 1,200 feet or 1,200 meters to where this effect kind of drops off. But we just wanted to be comprehensive, so we bring it all the way out to 2,000 meters. And we actually include in our sample all homes within 4,000 meters, um, just so that we can make sure we're capturing all the local economic conditions. You know, it's good to have a you know, kind of a treatment and control group uh, to compare to. Um, so this is our basic reg uh, regression. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. So basically, we have 
the price of the house entering in log form, um, uh, water quality entering here, interacted with waterfront, as well as these distance indicators. So this is basically just showing you um, kind of what I just said. Um, the distance indicators themselves, household characteristics, location characteristics, and time characteristics. So this is basically the regression that we're running. And we do a separate regression on each of the 14 counties. We were originally going back and forth as to whether or not to pool everything together and estimate one big regression across the entire sample versus the individual um, counties. But you know, it, it's much better to try to get an individual market and, and regress that um, to recover you know, particulars about the local uh, market. And so uh, we figured that although counties aren't a perfect indicator of markets, um, you know, they're a pretty good proxy for that. Like, I, I don't know if you guys have similar things here, but uh, I live in Montgomery County, Maryland. Prince George's County is right nearby, and there's a drastic difference in the taxes and the amenities provided between the two counties. I mean, the schools are terrible in Prince George's County, first off. So, I mean, that really limits a lot of people just looking at Montgomery County. But then there's a lot more amenities. In our area. I mean, you went to college in Prince George's County, so I think you can attest to that. Yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, for us, we, we thought the county was a relatively good proxy for uh, a market. So we run an individual regression on each of the 14 counties. And so uh, our basic results, I'll go into a little bit more detail about these in a second. Uh, basically, since a negative coefficient is inversely related to clarity because we're using the flood attenuation coefficient, when you get a negative coefficient here, that means that this is a positive value for water quality or water clarity. Um, so you know, if the in intuitive uh, result holds that people care more about water quality, then a negative and significant result here bears that out. And so these are just broken down by uh, waterfront, 0 to 500 meters, and 500 to 1,000 meters. You see that 7 out of the 14 counties do have this intuitive and significant sign. So we see a negative and significant impact, 7 out of the 14 counties. There are no positive and significant impacts. So it's either uh, the, the proper sign and significant or insignificant. And then you can see the, the effect really starts diminishing as you go farther away. And so to try to put this in dollar terms, um, if you look at the value of a 10% increase in clarity, then for those seven counties, um, we have the two highest being Anne Arundel County at about $18,000 that it adds to your home value if there would be a 10% improvement. And then Talbot County where there's a lot of high valued waterfront homes, it was about uh, $27,000 for a 10% improvement in water quality. And now keep in mind that these are waterfront homes, so the average value of one of these homes is probably 800000 to a $1 million. So, um, you know, it's a significant amount, but compared to the overall level of the home price, you know, it's, it, it fits in a reasonable range. And so now we want to take these estimates we got from Maryland and apply them to uh, the Virginia area and, and D.C., as well as other Maryland areas that also on a tributary, but we didn't have enough monitoring stations. So we actually let, we had more Maryland data that we were hoping to use, but there wasn't enough good monitoring data. Um, so we ended up having to do a benefits transfer to a few of those. And so when we estimate these hedonic models on Maryland areas, and then we want to apply this TMDL related change to those homes, for places where we have sales data, we just apply our estimated F, um, results to that house at a parcel level. So we can estimate a value for each house in that watershed and you know, very spatially explicit calculate what impact it would have. Um, but then for uh, Virginia, uh, DC, and Maryland areas not in the sample, this is where we're going to use our benefits transfer. And we're going to focus on the census block level. So kind of aggregate up to the census block because that's where we have information. We don't have this detailed home information there, but we do have census characteristics so that we can control for, you know, income and education, uh, population density, and other things in the area. And um, so, you know, these are just some of the things we controlled for: um, number of housing units within a thousand meters, you know, uh, house average housing value, income, population density, uh, percentage of second homes. Because we thought, you know, if there are a lot of people with uh, rentals in the area, that might mean that there's more of a value for water quality there. You've got a lot more tourists coming in, um, and, and then a few GIS-related variables. So these are things we want to control for in our benefits transfer to try to make it more accurate, 
really reduce the error in there to control for these characteristics on the ground. And um, so, uh, I, ideally, I was hoping to uh, bring the actual results from the TMDL here, uh, but there's been a few political uh, decisions that um, we're not allowed to release the full uh, value yet because we're waiting for the state preference survey to come out and a few other things, and they don't. EPA doesn't want these things um, out in the public yet until we can release them all at once. So I promise you that'll be coming soon. But we can use a, a rough 10% change in clarity. So apply a 10% improvement to all water uh, in the area, and that's what we're going to base our benefits on, which is a, a pretty rough approximation about what the TMDL will do. And so if you're looking at the 14 Maryland counties that we have, the total value of the improvement is about um, 152 million for waterfront homes and 124 million for non-waterfront homes. So basically, in these 14 Maryland counties, it's about 276 million dollars for a 10% improvement in clarity, which is a not insignificant sum. Then, when you apply this to um, the other areas, we're looking at approximately another 146 million dollar uh, home price increase after a benefit transfer. So the addition of those two is about you know, the total value of this 10% improvement in quality. And now keep in mind that this is just the value for homeowners that are located near the bay. And this doesn't account for people who travel there, people who go boating on it, who don't live right nearby. It doesn't include renters. Um, so this is just you know, one small fraction of what the value of the TMDL is. But the value from property prices could be substantial. And so just to kind of summarize, um, out of our 14 counties, we had seven with the intuitive and significant sign. Um, we had about an average across all counties of a 0.6% improvement from a 10% increase in clarity. And then, you know, about $400 million in net present value benefits from uh, both hedonic and benefit transfer counties. So uh, when you annualize that, so that's the net present value, when you bring that to a yearly amount, so what's it worth every year? That's about 12 to $28 million per year for the value of the TMP. So that's all I had. I welcome any questions. What's the estimate on the cost of getting that 10% increase? Is, uh, is it less than this number or more? Uh, well, I can't give out specifics. It is a... Uh, it is in the billions. Um, so that's why I try to emphasize that this is just a, a fraction of the total value, you know, just for people living in the waterfront. Um, but uh, you know, the, the cost estimate is also fraught with issues because we have to rely on information that the counties give us. And so there's kind of like a bait and switch game where they want to tell EPA that it's way more expensive than it should be and that they're going to use all these really expensive stormwater practices to do it. And you know, it's like we, we, we can't, we have to take that all at face value, even though we know when they're actually implementing it, they're going to be doing different things. Um, so, you know, we, we expect that the cost estimate will be moderately inflated. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, the cost estimate is in the billions. Um, not, not the high, but, you know, lower, <laughs> lower, lower billions. So it's not cheap, but um, we actually, the, the majority of the benefits um, we get in our miles are going to come in from the State of Preference Survey, because for the State of Preference Survey, they had uh, a representative sample from both within and outside of the watershed. They're actually curious as to whether or not people outside of the watershed would have a positive value for the Chesapeake Bay. And actually did find that you know, even people as far as North Carolina would, you know, are willing to pay to improve the Chesapeake Bay. So there's a lot of values that are coming from that survey. Um, you know, and so uh, when, you, when you take those into account, um, you know, there is a, the confidence intervals overlap for the benefits and costs. I'm just curious, uh, because here we have a very affluent communities that are by water and people care about the water quality there. When you were doing this survey, did you find that the people that were on the bay cared more about it or would invest more to uh, get these gains? And what do you think a $25,000 value to their million dollar house would really, would that motivate them? or? Yeah, I think in the, in the State of Preference Survey, they definitely had um, a, a, a directional impact so that people closer to the Bay definitely had a higher value. But it wasn't, it was surprisingly less than they would have thought. 
Um, like it didn't diminish uh, as quickly as I would have imagined. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I would think that as a waterfront homeowner, I, that would motivate me. I mean, especially in Talbot County with $26,000. I mean, that's a significant amount. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we haven't gone out to the community with this yet because it hasn't fully been released. Um, so yeah, we haven't fully seen the community response yet. But, I mean, I, I would personally think so, right? I mean, I'm not a waterfront homeowner, but if I was, I would think it would rule me in a little bit. But maybe maybe these people see it as, as well, how much my tax is going to go up? Um, you know, what is it going to cost to actually um, achieve that 10%? Um, so in that case, 25000 on a million doesn't... Right. That's a, that's a very um, salient point, um, especially in the state of preference survey, they actually go back and forth as to how to ask people about this value. So you can either ask people about direct payments, would you be willing to contribute greatly? Um, you know, there's a, there's a wide literature on this as to how you pose these costs to people, and they actually did end up going with, assume that your taxes go up by this percent each year, and that's how it's going to be paid for. What would you be willing to pay? And they present people with a bunch of different choices. And do you want the bay to go up this much, stay the same? If you think so, they're basically comparing or trading off taxes for improvements in the bay. So I think some of that's uh, dealt with in the state of preference survey. Um, but I mean, for properties, you wouldn't necessarily expect the property taxes to immediately increase with this. I mean, since that's done at such a local level, it might not be coming out of there. Um, but it certainly would be worth looking into. I mean, if you take it pretty far down the line, um, if it is the case that the TMDL is going to improve the value of these homes with better water quality, it may be the case that you get more tax revenue out of that. Because if now the homes are all assessed at a higher value, um, I mean, that might be where people get hit. The town gets more revenue, but the people might have to pay more taxes on them. So I don't know if that's where you're going, but yeah, that is one of the, the trade-offs you definitely have to make. Yeah. Um, how long would it take? What? How long would it take to reset 10%? Um, <laughs> So the projections we're getting, so like the TMDL has to be fully in place by I think 2020 or 2022, uh, but but then I mean there may be a lag before it's fully realized, right? So yeah, these are net present value estimates I put up. So yeah, if there is some real bumpiness in terms of how these are achieved, then this is um, these uh, benefits would certainly be pushed out in time. So yeah, that's that's a good point. Is that the implementation of this certainly matters in terms of when these benefits are delivered. Did you mean that, or did you mean how long would it take to improve water quality by 10%? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm, yeah, so, so to improve water quality yeah, by 10% is what I'm saying is there would certainly be ups and downs in that. And so um, these estimates assume that it's fully achieved and the benefits transfer. So you might discount it a little bit if you believe it takes a lot longer to go in place. Uh, yeah, um, on your, the dual log, Yeah, there's a, I mean, so there's a bunch of different ways that this has been done in the literature, and this is one of the more popular ways is that, so yeah, so this leaves us, instead of having, a, what this does is if you had water quality entering by itself, um, that would basically say that there's just a general water quality effect for homes not near the bay, um, as opposed to the way we did it with water quality entering only in interaction terms, then you only have a water quality effect for waterfront and then every 500 meters out. And so since we included homes beyond that, we're not assuming that there's kind of this general water quality effect for those. Um, so, so that's kind of the difference there. That's why we decided to it doesn't introduce any bias? Um, if, if you believe it's the case that homes beyond 2,000 meters don't have an impact there, then I think it doesn't. Which uh, The previous literature suggested it only goes out to about 1,000. And our meta-analysis um, kind of said that it goes out to about 500, 700 meters. So I think based on those results, we, we, we thought it was pretty safe to, to include that. Um, but we, we do actually explore a few other different specifications. And when we release the paper, they'll be in there. So it's, it's a good point. But there are a few other ways to do this. 
living. I guess I'll just move over this way. So. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Has um, the idea of flood zones and the subsidence of some of that coastline that's going on that's known about people who live on the coast and have waterfront property. Yeah. We, um, yeah, we actually struggled a lot with that. And there's a few other papers um, on flood zones in hedonic concepts that have really struggled with this too, in terms of uh, when you live in a flood zone, it's a negative impact because you have to pay the insurance for it. But at the same time, a lot of places in the flood zone are the more desirable places to live. Everybody wants to live on the coast in the flood zone. And there's federal subsidies that mess up that relationship a bit. So we do have a flood zone variable in here that we're controlling for. Um, but yeah, it, it is a very um, uh, complicated relationship. And in, in another paper that we use these same data on, we actually look at um, sea level rise zones, flood zones, and adaptation structures. So in Anne Arundel County, we had really good data that they, they actually got by um, the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences sent boats along the entire length of the coast and using uh, GPS units and um, cameras, completely logged all the breakwaters, bulkheads, all of that in there. And so, you know, very good data set. So we match that up to some of these waterfront homes. And we find that um, if you live in a sea level rise zone, um, it's a big negative impact on your house. And that's almost completely recouped if you have a bulkhead or riprap on your house. So yeah, so those are definitely important characteristics of living on the waterfront. So it's really important to control those. Just moving across this way. Yeah, so I think it's pretty cool what you guys did. And since that you're able to make projections into the future about what water quality may be like in the Chesapeake 10 years, 20 years down the road, assuming that water quality doesn't change in a linear manner, could you guys then calculate um, what it would what be the penalty to homeowners for not improving the water quality, and then come up with some kind of cost benefit analysis to find the optimization of the tax penalty versus um, not improving it versus <coughs> improving it. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, you theoretically <laughs> these these estimates could go either way, so that if, if you thought water quality would get worse, then you would kind of just flip the sign of these, and that would be the damage to the homes. Um, but yeah, that that would be an That'd be very interesting to try to <laughs> optimize over there. I'll have to talk to some of my colleagues, and that's a very good point. <laughs> okay. I think, if I understand it, you classified all property as either waterfront or not. Yes. Um, but waterfront's not all the same. If you're on an intertidal creek versus if you're on a river versus if you're on the bank of the bay itself. And property value, tend, I would guess, would be correlated with yep. the nature of that. Yeah. So my water quality. Yes. So are you sure there's not compounding variables such as that um, that are actually driving the difference rather than the public's perception of water quality? So so um, we did try a few things, first off, by just using a bayfront versus tributary variable. Um, we didn't actually get much action from that. But I think a lot of that has to do with we're looking at the county level for these. And there might not be as much variation in that at the county level. But we do have. Um, several measures in there that um, the Chesapeake Bay uses uh, to classify the type of water, which is mesohaline, oligohaline, and uh, are based on the salinity there. And so we do have controls for that in there. And that, that kind of is a proxy for whether or not you're a river or directly on the bay, because that'll determine how much fresh water is in there. So we have tried to use those to try to control for those types of effects. Uh, but yeah, I agree. I mean, living right on the bay and you have a nice view of like this huge watershed with lots of ships should be different than you know a smaller uh, tributary. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've tried, done as best as we can to try to control for that. Um, so I know there's been significant gains made with the uh, Tampa Bay Estuary Program. They've done a big economic analysis down there. Um, I, w I know that part of that analysis looked at things like improvement on different industries or tourism and fishing and things like that. So it was a lot more incorporated. I'm assuming that could really increase the value gained from that improved water clarity. Is there any type of interest in doing a similar type of thing for the Chesapeake? Yeah, yeah. So um, I put up that slide at the beginning with impacts we're looking at. We tried to get um, some of the main ones outside of environmental economics. So 
um, groundwater, you can look at uh, blue baby uh, effects, um, look at the decrease in the dredging cost, and, and a few others. And we tried to look at some other broad economic impacts, fishing supplies purchased and whatnot. Um, so I, I think we tried to mine as much as we could get out of there um, in terms of an environmental economics approach. But I mean, there certainly could be plenty of stuff left on the table. I mean, I remember one aspect they were basically able to say, you know, like one out of five jobs is affected by the, you know, the, the quality of the bay. And, and within that, you know, when you have good, good quality or not, you know, it depends on how much income you can earn. Yeah. Um, so that is, there are, I've seen several reports um, similar to that out, some within the Chesapeake, but that's where we get into trouble um, with, uh, and I tried to go into that a little bit in the beginning, versus the total value versus the marginal value. Um, so in, in that case, that basically says that the Tampa Bay supports one out of every five jobs. But you know that's not really looking at a change, right? That's not really saying that if you improve water quality in the Chesapeake Bay, this many jobs are coming out of it. So that's kind of looking at this, this total value impact. So that's one of the areas we have to be really careful about what the baseline is from when we're looking at some of these effects. But, but um, uh, this is not to say that those aren't important effects um, to look at. And you know, in, in terms of we want to clean up the Chesapeake Bay because there are this many jobs that depend on it and there are all these economic impacts of it. Those are certainly things that you would want to discuss in a cost-benefit analysis, but when you're just looking at this marginal change, it gets a little bit trickier as to what the baseline is. So one of, one of the interesting things was the measure of water quality that you use, which is clarity. And it seems like that might be a little bit of a weak one in terms of expecting a response, because it's the perception of something, whether it's prettier or just a little bit prettier. And I was wondering if you had, so, you know, so here in some of the Long Island Bays, we have water quality issues that, that have to do with harmful algal blooms, some of which are harmful to human health, like PSP outbreaks. And it seems like if you were doing an analysis on something like that, which the water quality indicator is directly related to human health, mm -hmm. um, you might get a much bigger response. Yeah, I, th I think that's definitely where the literature is going towards now. Um, so yeah, there's actually much of the water quality hedonic literature is currently in the Northeast. There's a few studies in Florida, and now there's a few on the West Coast. Um, but they're really starting to broaden out. Uh, last year, I put out a paper that compared um, clarity, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and um, chlorophyll, I think. Because in, in Florida, there's a combined indicator where they take nitrogen, phosphorus, and chlorophyll and, and get like a zero to 100 ba value based on that to try to be more representative of the ecosystem. And we found that if you were to use one of those indicators individually, just run a regression with just nitrogen, run a regression with just phosphorus, um, and, and apply benefits from that, we found that would vastly overinflate benefits. Um, because when you put one of those in alone, it doesn't account for the relationship between those. So you might have a nitrogen limited lake and so then if you model an improvement in that lake, uh, because it's nitrogen limited, you're not, the, the quality is not going to improve at all. And so you have to account for that when you're, when you're putting that in the model. And so that's kind of the results we came up with in this paper. But, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of best uh, things to use. I mean, I think the past literature just liked clarity because you know, intuitively people can see it. Um, we also put it in, one of the reasons we like to put it in, in uh, natural logarithm form is because that makes it so that the impact of water quality can vary uh, be different over different levels of water quality. So you might think that in really dirty water, water you'll notice uh, a six inch change in clarity much more than if the water is really pristine and you have a six inch improvement there, you might not uh, notice as much. So, so yeah, I, I think the literature is definitely trending uh, towards that and there's definitely a lot of things to be done there. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, so I use correlation between uh, decreasing water quality and Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think as I said earlier, um, you know, these are just based on uh, observed variations in water quality. So um, you would assume that if you think that people have a similar value for improvements as far as decreases, then I think you could assume that these are linear and that you could 
apply the same thing for a 10% decrease. Um, but, you know, there is a lot of uh, behavioral econ literature that looks at, like, prospect theory that says people care a lot more about losses than they do about gains. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's why, like, in the stock market, when all of a sudden the stock market drops, you see everybody selling, everybody selling, everybody selling. But, but you know, when the stock market gets going up, you don't see the same response from normal people to try to get into the market. I just illustrating that, yeah, there's this negative response. So, yeah, I think that's that's definitely a really good point. That um, uh, I'm not sure how to differentiate it between. I mean, the one way you could look at that is if you were to try to look at trends in water quality and put something in your paper as to um, has the water been improving or decreasing and try to find some representation of a trend. Um, we, we tried a few things with that that weren't as successful, like we used a three-year um, average instead of a one-year average. These all use a one-year average of the spring and summer clarity. Um, and so we tried to look at three years, but that didn't really get at this directional impact. So yeah, if you were able to perhaps include an average as well as a direction, that might be one way to capture that. Um, yeah, so that's, we actually have a side paper on that I'm presenting in um, the Southern Economic Association meeting, is that, uh, that there are a few people that have a hypothesis that people care a lot less about environmental amenities in a downturn, right? When things are going up and people are having more money, they care more about the environment and that might be more related to the house. But when the market is going down and tanking, um, is it the case that, you know, people kind of environmental amenities are less important. Um, and what we find in that paper is actually that um, in some places when it's going down, people actually care more about it. Um, we find that we are expected to be either insignificant or the opposite impact. And we, we found this result that you know, when it's going down, in some places people care more. And, and that might be an indication that um, these places with higher water quality, for instance, are you know, looked at as better quality homes. So when the market is tanking, um, people are placing a higher premium on better quality homes. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of like the supply effect coming in here. Um, but yeah, we were, we were kind of surprised to see that. And there's another paper by Joukowsky who's at Wharton right now, um, and they found the same thing in South Florida. So, um, yeah, it's a very interesting thing to look at. So we hope to tease that out a little bit more in this companion paper. Yeah, that's a that's a really good impact, and I think the the literature, the, not only in hedonics but in stated preference, a lot of other water quality stuff. There's a real dearth of stuff looking at heavy metals. Um, this is actually very relevant right now. Um, I'm working on this rule that's about to be signed at the end of September called um, the Steam Electric Effluent Limitation Guidelines. Um, it's actually a neat rule in that we've been putting these controls on power plants for years that scrub the air of pollutants, but the problem is. We scrub the air at them, and what a lot of these plants just do is then the stuff that they pull out of the air, they put in a settling pond behind the power plant, and then that just like leaks into local waterways. <laughs> so you know it's good to get it out of the air, but then, but then it's just been going into the water from there. So EPA is finally doing something about this, and um, and so one of the big benefits of that is that a lot of less of the heavy metals get into the water. But now the problem for us now is that we're trying to place values on removing a lot of these metals. And the hedonics and other environmental economics literature hasn't been uh, as focused on metals before. So um, it, it's a definite gap, and, and there needs to be a lot more. Uh, but yeah, I think you're right. There certainly is a, a component to that that it might look clear, but there's still some toxicity. Have you guys also looked at um, other persistent contaminants like PCBs and other stuff? I know there's like the remediation effort in the Hudson for yeah. the electric plants up there. Um, we have not, and part of the problem is there's just not as much data on PCBs. I mean, so the EPA and local uh, states have monitoring stations that monitor for some of the, you know, general pollutants, but I, yeah, I don't think there's just as much data on PCBs. 
Uh, but yeah, in a similar vein, I mean, I, I think it should be something that people look at. That might be more the realm of state of preference surveys versus this when you don't have the data. So I think we need to wrap it up for everyone here. But uh, thanks a lot, Patrick. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, Patrick will be hanging out at the uh, barbecue if anyone has any other questions. Don't forget the picnic. Yes. You can hang out